Okay, we will get started now. So, welcome uh, to today's ACUR at ANU student presentation session, Insights from a Digital World. Before we begin, I would like to uh, take a moment to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and to pay respects to their elders past and present. My name is Aidan Delaney and I will be chairing today's session. Uh, our first presenter for today is Connor Patton. So please start when you are ready. Thank you. Um, I'll just share my screen. Can everybody see that? Perfect, thanks. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Connor Patton. Uh, I'm studying a Bachelor of Philosophy honours at uh, majoring in Law and Society and Criminology at the University of Western Australia. And today I'll be presenting Lurk More, a digital ethnography exploring the maintenance of identity in an anonymous online community. I sit at my desk, open my browser, and I'm suddenly relocated. I move from home to the field. I scroll through pages of the Serbic diatribe and bizarre symbols. Heated political discussion fuses with crude, vexing humour as it becomes apparent that this is a community defying ready description. I have entered the domain of slash poll. Despite being easy to locate, it remains an exclusive community with well-defined boundaries. Perhaps this rigorous communal regulation occurs because of the ease of access. All that is required to get to the community is a computer and an internet connection, ubiquitous tools in our increasingly digitalized world. However, to understand the content, to really unpack it, is a different thing entirely. These were my first impressions upon entering Slash Poll, a sub sub board of anonymous website 4chan. I undertook this research because, one, I was fascinated by the seemingly inaccessible cultural in group of the Slash Poll board. And two, I was equally interested in the various methodological and conceptual challenges that a digital ethnography of this type would potentially pose uh, to the researcher. Today, I'd like to do two things. I will discuss this brief ethnographic foray into the online community of Slash Poll, asking how it is that anonymous users establish and maintain such a strong sense of both collective and individual identity. And I will argue that the evolution of cultural interaction, especially in the digital age, requires the development of innovative ethnographic methodologies going forward. Whilst at first glance, these methodologies depart from the ethnographic tradition, ultimately, I think, they only strengthen ethnography's presence as a means of understanding culture in the 21st century. My methodology deviated from widely held ethnographic norms. Instead of actively participating by posting myself and creating content, a process commonly referred to as participant observation, I only observed users' interactions by lurking or reading without posting. This sort of approach has been described by others as a necessary ethical and practical concession, though I actually view it as an even more appropriate method than traditional participant observation. As Ingold suggested, ethnography is fundamentally the deceptively simple act of writing about the people. The best way of achieving this is to do as those we study do, such that when we write about them, we do so with a real sense of the similitude or as Gertz said, of being there. This method allowed me to do just this. Lurking is how new members learn the rules of slash poll. So given the ephemerality of posts, which expire rapidly once posted, I took screenshots to preserve interactions. I then returned to these, conducting textual and image analyses rooted in sociologist Pierre Bourdieu's concepts of the habitus and the hexus, which I'll expand upon later. Before I proceed, the online field raises a number of important ethical questions. Most obviously, I couldn't contact my participants to ask for their informed consent. Some ethnographers have argued that this is a non-issue in public spaces. However, whether a space is truly public or private online is quite a complex issue. So I adopted Girard's solution. That which is accessible by anybody can be considered public. The, anonym the anonymity of participants also helps quell concerns regarding privacy and protection that normally underpin informed consent. Second, I couldn't contact my participants to share or discuss my findings given the rules of the slash poll board and the nature of my research. As such, I note here that these findings are the product of myself as research instrument and are not intended to subjugate the cultural property of the slash poll board. 
To understand the field online, ethnographers must understand the interfaces which shape it. The interface of slash poll, especially its anonymity, necessitates a reliance on symbol. Entering slash poll, I was confronted by the site's anachronic presentation. The interface is reminiscent of the chat boards of the early 2000s and appears ruled by anarchy. Evidence of organizational structure is sparse, other than the timestamp function ordering threads by time posted. The threads themselves are basic, consisting of an original post and responses ordered chronologically. Inability to create a user profile limits personalization of the site and its content. This is no Facebook or Twitter. Users are anonymous and are identified only by a string of numbers or by a randomized username. Traditional means of expressing identity are unavailable. However, identity emerges nonetheless. Bourdieu conceives of meaning as constructed between actors operating within a broader social field. He understands this as the habitus or the socialized dispositions influencing our perception and behavior within a society. Given slash poles anonymity, the habitus of this community really reinforces a distrust of outsiders. As Curlew has argued, anonymity renders identity a performative act such that users on slash poll must constantly perform their identity correctly to attain communal acceptance and the right to be there. Hexus refers to the schemas and attitudes which shape the way social beings interact with one another. Online, I think this can be seen in the way a user perceives and interacts with others in their comments through symbol and image. The hexus of slash poll emerges in two primary ways. First, the use of a unique cultural language, which, as I alluded to in the opening of this presentation, consists of confronting vulgar language, but which has a degree of pattern and consistency behind it, such that it has really become a dialect of this community. Second, the sharing of collectively understood images known as memes. On slash poll, these demonstrate cultural competence and secure group membership. They are also used to regulate community content and establish collective identity. Given the lack of explicit organizational features in the interface, certain practices of community regulation have evolved amongst users on slash poll. As an example, here a user mobilizes a political meme upon which they have superimposed the Reddit logo. The original meme was just a Trump meme. It didn't mention Reddit at all. Reddit being a popular pseudonymous social media site, which is understood on the community slash poll as inferior, as uh, something outside the community. And so this is a specific edition made by the user, drawing on this cultural understanding of Reddit's inferiority to suggest that the person who made the post to which this was responding belongs not on slash poll, but on Reddit. The meme is thus used to delineate a collective identity, reinforcing the exclusivity of slash poll particularly in comparison to other communities, showing what it is not. Additionally, users employ the unique language of slash poll to alienate others they view as threatening their community. Shill, a person advancing their own cause by deception, refers to users' failure to adequately perform their identity. Their use of slash poll is seen as fraudulent. This is conserved for particularly severe cases, often referring to deliberate attempts to undermine the community. And the term also draws explicit contrasts between slash poll and the mainstream, often contesting mainstream norms and advocating slash polls counterculture. So what? Well, slash poll is thus a fascinating place, readily found, yet simultaneously inaccessible to most. It is an exclusive community which, paired with its interface of anonymity, produces a habitus of distrust toward outsiders. Whilst at first glance organisational structure is absent, content is actually tightly regulated. Users must prove their identity as valid members of the slash bowl community by engaging with the hexes of the board, and the community constantly surveys content to preserve its collective identity and quite rigorously uh, shoots down any content which they see as violating their standards. This research process has revealed several interesting points about ethnography in the 21st century. First, as I said in opening this talk and discussing my methodology, the methodological adaptations that are required when engaging communities online, which are quite different to the traditional uh, physical ethnographies, but are becoming increasingly prevalent, of course, in the 21st century. Second, uh, this real process of blurring of life at home and research in the field, which occurs when conducting these digital ethnographies. 
Traditionally, in travelling to the field as a physical place, the ethnographer departed from their own culture. And this concept of distance between the home culture and the field was understood as key to ethnographic authority or the validity of the findings. To enter slash poll, all I had to do was sit down at my desk. I didn't undertake any real process of departing from my normal daily routine. At times, I found it difficult to distinguish between life as researcher and life at home. However, this duality, despite departing from convention, can be said to enhance the ethnographic merit of the work which emerges. Digitalization complicates boundaries between the physical and the online for everyone. Experiencing such disorientation in researching an online community only reflects the researcher's positioning within these broader webs of interaction. Thank you, your time say, is up. Thank you, I'd just like to say thank you very much to Associate Professor Dr. Martin Forsey for his guidance and inspiration, and here are my references. Thank you for listening. Okay, we now have five minutes for Q&A. Uh, to begin, judges, do you have any questions? Uh, I do have just a quick question, but also other comments. Um, this was a really good presentation. Con congratulations, Connor. A very interesting topic. I was wondering if you were a user, maybe I've missed this, uh, maybe you mentioned it, but were you a previous user of Slashpole before starting the research or you had to create an account for the purpose of this, uh, this work? Uh, sorry, uh, no, I, um, I wasn't uh, a previous user. In fact, I had very little experience with it and that's part of the reason I wanted to study it um, because it was this fascinating thing. It was like I could see how complex and sort of exclusive it was so I wanted to try and approach that and see if I could understand some of it myself. Um, in terms of creating an account, there's no account per se. Uh, you do sort of uh, sign a, a legal agreement with 4chan, the uh, owner and operator yeah. of the site, um, but beyond that you don't actually create any sort of account. There's no personalization. It's uh, just this randomized um, yeah, randomized uh, title basically that identifies who's making the post so people can tell who's actually making the post, but they have no idea who the person is, uh, et cetera. Um, and I didn't actually, of course, post anything myself. Um, I just read others' posts and tried to understand, unpack. Um, and that's how, yeah, that's how, as I've said, new members understand this community anyway. Yeah, and how do you see a 4chan and this community, for example, and its relation perhaps with 8chan and what happened in the US with this whole platform that played such an important role, um, I mean, such a destructive role in some ways? This is another reason why I wanted to um, undertake research into this, uh, because it's certainly something which is becoming increasingly topical. I mean, lots of people are familiar with Facebook, right? But Sites like 4chan and boards like Slash Poll actually have many millions of um, users every day. And it's something that is particularly prevalent amongst people who are my age uh, or who are, you know, undergraduate slash postgraduate university. And so it's something that's increasingly uh, relevant in the uh, digital age going forward. And it has been linked to things such as that. But there's also been a lot written about it by people who have been trained in traditional methods of ethnography uh, and people who perhaps don't have the perspective of um of a younger sort of generation of people who have basically grown up with this sort of these sort of websites you know this i mean slash poll i think aired in 2004 so it's something that's almost just i'm only barely uh, older than it um and i think it's important to get that perspective because i think the the members on slash poll it's such a it was very difficult to convey in in 10 minutes but it's such a complicated community there's lots said that would seem sort of very offensive and very, uh, or in, in some cases, it looks like it's advocating horrible, horrific crimes and those sorts of things. But there's also this whole degree of trying to be as uh, confronting as they possibly can, such that it really maintains this exclusivity. And it sort of really says, well, look at us versus the mainstream. It's trying to depart from the mainstream and establish this particular culture. Uh, and so to people who have no sort of understanding of that, it can really seem like, you know, well, it can seem like a terrorist cell in some cases, for instance, depending on what the post is, it can seem like an online hate group. It can seem like all sorts of things. And there's certainly an aspect of that. But the research I tried to approach was trying to sympathize with users of that board to try and get their perspective as much as I could, which is why I um, chose to do ethnography as opposed to looking at it perhaps from a more sociological perspective. I tried to really sort of understand how the users, users see the content themselves. And to sort of begin, I had to look at how do I actually get in here? What sort of tools are needed? And of course, symbol was the main one, which is the language and the memes. 
uh, that basically give you the key to unlocking meaning on um, slash poll. This is a very interesting topic and a great presentation. And just another comment, I thought you explained really well the methodology and also particularly your position and your role as a researcher using that methodology. And I think that's, that's really uh, great. Uh, congrats. Thank you. Okay, we have a short bit of time left. Are there any other questions from the judges? Um, yeah, I guess just to follow up that point, I, um, I would, I would be interested to hear a little bit more about what where you see this going on, what you think the impact might be. So if one of the goals of understanding identity in communities like this is to potentially combat right wing extremism or, you know, I mean, you kind of steered clear of that um, moralistic kind of take on it and you're quite neutral, but I'm, I'm wondering what you think about that or what you think their implications are. That's certainly been um, a recent uh, implication in the literature. There was a paper published by another student actually in America uh, two years ago, um, and she very much took that approach, trying to understand, and she did interviews with people who um, were slash poll users. So it was a much smaller sort of group. It was about 10, 15 people, I think, but she actually talked to them and she tried to understand this process of, you know, uh, sort of indoctrination, this process of how people become that way. But some of the people, the problem with people on slash poll is they're, they're very hostile towards these sorts of approaches it's very much you know they don't want to be the subject of uh, research you know they they don't want to be part of the mainstream they really want to advocate against it and sorry thought, to interrupt but unfortunately we're at time there so i will have to move on to the next uh, presenter thank you okay uh thank you for that presentation and we'll now move on to our second presenter for today which is uh dian sako so if you'd like to uh, begin your presentation Yes, I will. I'll just share my screen. Um, I just need the Connor to turn his off. Thank you. Um, okay. Great. That. Okay. Uh, good morning. Thanks everyone for being here today. I'm Dion Seiko. I'm a psychology student, but I have a background in linguistics. And I'm going to talk today about facilitating intergenerational communication in the video calling format. So the background, <laughs> COVID-19, coronavirus, it got us all, it changed everything. Uh, changed the way we thought about it, changed the way we do everything. So in a surprise to no one, considering that this is an online conference, uh, the pandemic and its ensuing lockdowns and restrictions have given rise to an unprecedented amount of video calls. Zoom is something I used to do in a go-kart and now it's how we get to work every day. So in addition to working, our personal and social lives are also taking place through a screen. It was an adjustment that everyone had to make, but I want to draw your attention to uh, two demographics in, partic in particular, who were arguably the most impacted by the switch to virtual life, and that's young adults, uh, sorry, young children and older adults. Um, so a professor of mine and her colleagues conducted a study of Australian parents and grandparents and their use of video calls since the pandemic began. Uh, of the grandparents surveyed, 40% began video calling with their grandchildren for the first time during the pandemic. Applications like FaceTime and Facebook Messenger used on average two to three times a week now. And the video calling experience was predominantly positive. Uh, the respondents indicated that they were grateful to have an option uh, that allowed them to still stay in contact with their grandchildren to remain part of their lives. Uh, but it wasn't perfect. And of course, there are limitations associated with video calling. So a uh, deep dive into the literature directed me to three main areas that impact grandparents and grandchildren when using online communication. Uh, firstly, we probably don't need research to tell us that children have limited attention spans. Um, children under 10 have significant difficulty in maintaining phone conversations. Uh, even older children typically require scaffolding from their parents. Um, children tend to look at what they are interested in, and so child looking paradigm it uh, tells us that you know faces are very interesting, but the overwhelming uh, thing that grabs a child's attention is novelty. So what's new? And you're looking at my face on the screen now, you've been looking at it for a minute or two already, you're probably bored and looking away. So that's what kids are doing. 
with uh, grandparents, uh, attentional abilities also decline as we get older, but it doesn't get reflected in the same way as with children. So grandma's not going to get distracted and forget to pay attention to me, but it does lead to an issue with technological literacy. So interfaces, they're just not designed for older adults. Uh, you know, how am I supposed to remember where that feature is in that button of that sub menu of which even window am I in? Like, and you're looking at my feet and you're supposed to be looking at my face, which button flips the camera? I don't know, it's too many. And then I've got my shaky finger and I'm always pressing the button next to and ending the call by accident. By this time, baby, grandbaby is probably bored and he's chewing his shoe instead of paying attention to grandma. But the biggest thing for me uh, with my linguistic background was the vastly different styles of communication uh, between grandparents and grandchildren. So grand, uh, children are asynchronous. They have fluid here and now interaction patterns and they fo focus on their day-to-day -day activities. So they talk about what they're doing. But adults prefer a na narrative style with emotional and nostalgic content for older adults. So they prefer to recount something that's already happened with a distinctive beginning, middle and end. So this is a clash that is not so pertinent in face-to-face -face interactions because the kid does something and the grandparent narrates it. But online, what the kid is doing is the conversation. And so they lose interest really quickly and struggle to talk about it and to stay engaged. So what can we do? Well, uh, my idea was to design, uh, create a video calling environment that maybe it's an application or an extension to an existing application that specifically caters to these needs. So the basic premise of the design would be non-mirrored video interface. So the layout of the screen is not identical to each user. So effects that are happening on your screen maybe don't necessarily don't happen on mine. Um, basically speaking, how the application appears to each user is tailored to their individual needs. For grandparents, the interface design will be simple, focused on their grandchild. The current research indicates that the design uh, should be functional based on a conventional mental model of a phone call. Uh, large buttons, tolerant of imprecise gestures, uh, salient features, stuff like this. Uh, for grandchildren, the interface needs to be dynamically engaging to cater to their attention needs, um, focusing them on grandma or grandpa. Um, Research suggests that you know, auditory stimuli automatically attract attention. There's studies that say that specific patterns of specific sizes uh, can regain and hold children's attention. So with that in mind, it is possible to design uh, an interaction where the application recognizes that the kid's not paying attention anymore and automatically tries to get their attention back with sounds and specific images. But importantly, grandma or grandpa doesn't have to do this. It happens automatically because we don't want them to get overwhelmed with it. Where's the button? Where's the feature? Where's the menu? Currently, we're running a proof of concept experiment. So we're using Zoom right now and we're uh, facilitating video calls between grandparents and grandchildren, switching between a normal condition like I have now and a filtered condition. And we're measuring face uh, looking time, we're measuring facial expressions, and we're using uh, pre and post survey self report measures from the grandparents to try and understand whether something as simple as putting on some bunny ears can help the kid remain attention, like attending to grandma, and whether grandma feels that that's helpful to her to have a little bit of an aid in the screen to help her retain the kid's attention. But why? Do we even care? Like, why do we need to do this? What is it about grandparents and grandchildren that matters? So it's a really unique intergenerational bond between grandparents and grandchildren. So beginning with the obvious, the physical and mental benefits for both de demographics are well documented. Old adults live longer. Uh, they have increased vitality. Mentally, they have enhanced self-identity and social value. So they're less likely, uh, they're less prone to depression and anxiety and it slows the onset of physical and mental illness for old adults. For grandchildren, having a bond with a grandparent has greater amount of documented, like huge documented benefits. The grandparents contribute to the development of personality traits and the physical and mental health of their grandchildren, as well as literacy and social acclimation skills. Uh, but even further than physical and, and mental benefits, on an individual le level, a strong grandparental relationship is predictive of the grandchild's increased resilience in the face of adversity. And this is particularly notable among minority groups. 
And they also, grandchildren, show stronger stress coping mechanisms when they have a, a strong role model in a grandparent. On a societal level, grandparent-grandchild relationships correlate with significantly decreased rate of risk-taking behaviours. So less alcohol consumption, less drug taking, less tobacco use, and uh, decreased risky sexual behaviour. There's even a study that shows that a strong grandparental uh, bond decreases the likelihood of a grandchild being incarcerated at some point in their life. Economically, the benefits are obvious. Grandparents and grandchildren who are closer to each other are healthier and they're safer. So they do better in school, they contribute more to the economy, they're less likely to be in hospital or in prison. And then there's just the simple benefit of the grandparent looking after their grandchildren. And so it's beneficial to the parents as well. It's, it's good for everyone. So this uh, app that I'm hoping that we're designing is, well, we are designing, but I don't know. I think it's so important and I think it really matters. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, we now have five minutes for Q&A. Um, I'll begin again with the judges. Do you have any questions? Okay, if we don't have any questions from the judges, uh, audience, please, um, if you have any questions for our presenter, uh, please type your, your question into the chat or raise your hand and we can unmute you. Um, I'll, go, I'll go ahead with a question. Sorry, I just didn't want to jump over um, everybody else. Um, Deanne, can you talk a little bit more about, um, about the app that you're developing and, and the research that you're doing um, around, um, yeah, how you're proxying that with Zoom? Um, so what, what's the actual research study that you're doing? Yeah, so we're, um, uh, it's, it is just a proof of concept at the moment because an app takes a really long time to decide and it needs to be funded. Uh, so that's kind of happening parallel to what we're doing in the study at the moment is just using Zoom at the moment. Um, it runs where I enter a video call with a grandparent and uh, a parent and the grandchild. Uh, I ask, I teach the grandparent how to turn on a filter, which I can do right now. Um, this one. Ooh, it's not coming up. See, I don't Oh, there we go. So I turn, I teach them how to turn on a filter and then turn it off again. And I measure, um, like I let them just I disappear, I let them interact with their grandchild and I measure how long the grandkid is looking and paying attention to the grandmother or the grandfather, it's mostly grandmas at the moment, um, while they've got the filter on versus while they get the filter off. That's what I'm doing online while I'm in the video call, but there's also pre and post uh, surveys for the grandparent um, that gauges their interaction, loneliness, uh, emotional, um, stability, all this sort of stuff. And then we're going to do some offline coding as well uh, with facial expressions, um, particularly smiles, because we want kids to, the, the point I, I think is most salient is that with the increased uh, separation, physical separation of grandchildren and grandparents, we don't want kids to not recognize their grandparents. So we don't want them to put the grandparent into the stranger anxiety section that happens at around three years old. So we want the grandkid to really know who the grandparent is. We want them to look and hopefully having a filter on their face can make them look at their grandparent a little bit more uh, because when, when they get back together again, when, you know, the grand, we don't want, we want them to know who they are. We want them to recognize them so that these relationships can develop because from there, the benefits are exponential. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Um, Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Uh, excellent presentation. I really enjoyed it. And I like that you used so many examples of, uh, of real life uh, grandparents, uh, grandchildren relationships. So it made it much easier to understand. Um, so uh, my question is, where did you come up with the idea of using the filters instead of anything else, like having maybe a toy with them or um, what was the um, reasoning behind using filters? Um, the automation of it. So the, this is actually, this technology is really good. Look how well it 
follows my face. What I wanted to combine with this application was something for the grandchildren to get their attention, but also take away the onus on the grandparent of turning it on and off and remembering where the features are. And so I want these to be able to come on automatically. So you can't get a physical toy and pick, I mean, obviously you can do that. And that's very easy. A lot of the grandparents I'm interacting with in, in the study are saying that they're like, Oh, I usually have a toy here that comes along with me in the conversation. But uh, what the purpose of this would be, would be potentially uh, adults who struggle a lot more with technology than the ones that I'm studying at the moment uh, and taking the responsibility of turning these features on and off for them and making it come on by itself. That's why we wanted to do the, the filters. And have you had any feedback regarding grandparents using filters on uh, the platform? Yeah, even just the, so I haven't done the analysis yet, we're still collecting the data, but even the anecdotal like post-session like discussion that I have with them, they're like, this is really cool, uh, I really like it, we use this one, it's very simple, it's very easy, and they say, you know, we usually use Facebook Messenger or FaceTime or something like that, but we might use Zoom now because the kids seem to really respond to it, so just the anecdotal evidence so far suggests that it is uh, really positive and helpful. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. That um, brings us to time. So um, we might end that presentation there. Thank you very much. And we'll now move on to our final presentation for today's session, which is from uh, Bridget Smart. So Bridget, if you'd like to begin. Perfect. Hopefully you can all see my Zoom. Um, hi everyone, my name is Bridget Smart and I'm currently doing research in online social networks and mechanisms of influence online. Today, I'm going to start by asking you a question. How often have you heard something from a friend and then shared it with someone else without even stopping to consider if that piece of information was true or false? How often have you seen something on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or anywhere online and done exactly the same thing? Our increasing reliance on online social media and online news platforms for information is concerning in light of issues like fake news, misinformation, and disinformation campaigns which means that the quality of the information we see online is not guaranteed and can easily be false or misleading. My research aims to better understand this interaction between what we see online and how people behave in the real world. In this presentation, I'm gonna go through a case study from a very tragic event which occurred earlier this year. Now, I'm sure this image looks familiar to most of you, but for those who don't know, this is an image of the storming on the US Capitol building which occurred on the 6th of January this year. Rioters breached the building and tragically resulted in the loss of five lives. The events that day were tragic and scary, but if I asked you what role social media played, what would you say? Some media outlets immediately began to claim that the protests were organised online and were driven by online activity. In this talk, we're going to be exploring that question and I'm going to be presenting some research I completed during an AMSI Vacation Research Scholarship with Dr Lewis Mitchell at Adelaide University. The contribution of this work is a proof of concept of a framework capable of quantitatively identifying users and events of interest, which we validated against the real world events on the 6th of January. For this project, we use Twitter data. We know that Twitter is a popular social media where tweets allow people to have discussions online, sharing short text segments which can express their opinions and views. There are 500 million tweets sent every day and around 68.7 million of Twitter's users are based in the US giving us a comprehensive picture of the opinions and thoughts of Americans. The tweets we collected were shared between 4.22 a.m. and 2.47 p.m. Washington time on the 6th of January. We collected our data using the Twitter API and the Tweepy library to collect these tweets live. On this slide, we have a screen grab of what one tweet looks like in our data. For every tweet, we collect the text of the tweet, any hashtags it has, who posted it, when it was posted, in universal time, and a few other pieces of information about the user. All times were converted to Washington time for our analysis. We began with a bit of data cleaning and some exploration to help us better understand structures in the data and how the events of the day can be best captured and understood. Ultimately, what we found was very promising. We could identify spikes in behavior which both preempted and reflected the real world events of the day. This plot shows the frequency of the five most popular hashtags in the data set binned into five minute intervals with the major events from the day overlaid in red. The first line shows when Trump's Save America rally begun near the White House, 
where Donald Trump and his lawyer Rudy Giuliani spoke, encouraging the rioters. After he spoke, the rioters began to make their way down toward the Capitol building. Looking at the green line, which shows the occurrence of the hashtag Capitol Riots, we can see that there was some interest early in the day, with a large spike just after the rally began. The next major marked event is when rioters and police began to clash at the Capitol and finally when rioters breached the police lines. We can see the hashtag 25th Amendment now gaining traction right before the rioters and police began to clash and a few other interesting behaviours with the hashtag breaking peaking just after the rally began and once again once rioters breached police lines. Rather than basic approaches that capture information flow across the network, which might look at the spread of hashtags or phrases across the network, we aim to look at how sentiment moves across the network. To do this, we use VEDA, a sentiment analysis tool which can help us to show how positive and negative sentiments move across the network. VEDA calculates a score for every word in a sentence and gives it a valence score between negative four and four and returns the four overall scores for each phrase which you can see on the slide. This word score comes from a predetermined list of words which have been manually created and tagged. The compound score, which is what we're looking at in this research, is computed by summing the valence scores of each word in the sentence and then normalised to return a value between negative one and one. Let's look at a relatively simple example. At the top, we can see the neutral sentence, I'm going to present my research. Although VEDA is quite simple and uses rules to handle a lot of the cases, it's able to handle emoticons, slang and acronyms, which we really commonly see in Twitter data. We can see that by adding a simple emoticon, VEDA recognises the second sentence as positive rather than neutral. VEDA also considers the word in context and can support a range of languages, making it almost perfect for use with Twitter data. Its main drawback is it isn't great with sarcasm. Another benefit of VEDA is it doesn't require training. Although it typically gives a lower accuracy than a CNN or other deep learning model on a data set, training a machine learning model requires labelled data, so the tweet and the sentiment, which we don't have in this case. So we calculated the four scores using VEDA for every tweet in our data set, allowing us to visualise these metrics over time. Here's the mean compound score across the day, so that's the average score in a way, with time along the x-axis and the same key events from earlier marked in red. We can see that the tweets were most negative just after the riots began, with a small spike again as rioters began making their way toward the capital. To identify drivers between, behind these changes in sentiment, we look at the people most frequently replied to or mentioned in a tweet. This graph shows the 14 people most frequently replied to across our data set and the number of tweets which mention them across time, once again bin into five minute intervals. We can see these surges that occur in response to events throughout the day. One really interesting one is a spike in replies to Representative Mo Brooks, which we can see in pink, who condemned the riots with a public release, which coincides with the increase in negative sentiment we saw earlier. Another really interesting spike is from Rudy Giuliani in grey, this spike in mentions coincides with the release of a voicemail which was left on the wrong person's phone, in which he asked Republican senators to delay the counting of Senate votes. Here's an example of some of those tweets. In addition to the voicemail, these tweets are also in response to a speech he gave, where he told rioters, let's have a trial by combat. What's important is that this surge is driven by an external factor, not a factor which is internal to the network. Let's look at it a little bit more. We're just gonna consider the tweets which mention Rudy Giuliani around the time, in the time window which I've highlighted in the plot. And we're gonna look at the sentiment of those tweets and see if there's any interesting features about the spike. Just considering this really small window allows us to get a gauge of the population's general opinion of Rudy Giuliani's actions and identify unusual users who might be driving conversation which differs from the consensus. Those tweets which are occurring significantly far from zero as they allow us to identify and understand community drivers. In this plot, you might notice there are nothing around zero, and that's just because we've removed all of those tweets that have a sentiment score of zero, which is most tweets, just because of how beta works. Using our sentiment data, we can see responses have a really good range from negative to positive, but the tweets do tend to be more negative overall. Using a combination of this sentiment data and information about who is being replied to more frequently can give us insight into what responses people are eliciting online. One flaw with this is that we're unable to automatically determine what the initial event was which triggered the discussion. A possible method of understanding the origin of such factors and how these factors shape the network, for example, by creating smaller echo chambers which can reinforce radical ideas, is by using network modeling. This can help us understand if these sentiments are influencing 
or generating extreme behaviour online rather than just being a topic of conversation. To start our network modelling, we needed to do a little bit more data cleaning. Using our previous list, we filtered all tweets to only include tweets which mention the top 100 most mentioned users. That sounds a little bit confusing, but it basically means we still included tweets posted by anyone, as long as they replied to one of those users in our top 100. That reduced our data to around half a million tweets. We can begin to understand a little bit more by looking at the network structure and between the centrality in the network. Between the centrality describes the number of shortest paths which pass through a node. Sounds a bit mathsy, but we can think of it as how often a certain user moves information between other pairs of users. Remembering that a link in our network means that one user mentioned or retweeted another. This network shows only the first 10,000 tweets of the day. We can see the users with the highest between the centrality on the left, showing us not which topics are driving conversation, but which users are. Contrast this with the network, which then shows the mi middle 10,000 tweets of the day. With a bit of analysis, we can see the network structure and average degree are similar. But we can see that the conversation is centered around a different list of users. We can see the most between user was representative Mo Brooks, which corresponds to the spike we saw earlier. Considering the network structure allows an extension of this project, as by considering where in a network new sentiments are first seen, we can deduce whether it's in response to an external or internal event. This was the end of my six week project, and I'm continuing similar work in my masters currently. The work showed you can use quantitative techniques to derive users and events of interest from a real world Twitter data set and we validated our findings on the events of the 6th of January. I look forward to your questions and thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much for that. Okay, we now have five minutes for Q&A, so I'll begin again by asking the judges if you have any questions. Um, great presentation, Bridget, thank you. Um, yeah, I guess I just wanted to ask a bit more about, about next steps and implications. Um, so how you think that this knowledge might be used um, to address misinformation or to track, you know, major events as they're unfolding in real time, for instance. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so this is actually what I'm doing my master's on currently. So it's a very large field and with the big data sets, there's lots of different ways you can approach things. Um, there's lots of really good existing work from Adelaide institutions on different areas of this. Personally, I've been looking at event detection. Um, so creating code that quickly generates and identifies these surges which are occurring in real time. Um, I've also been looking at identifying malicious actors online. So that might, you might sort of think back to Russian influence in US elections and how we can identify the accounts which are involved in those sorts of attacks. So how we can characterize their behavior and how their information flows. I guess the difference from a mathematical perspective as opposed to a sociological one is that we don't necessarily care what the information is. We're more concerned about how it's moving across the network. Um, so I've been doing a lot of work with network analysis and graph theory um, and also entropy and information flow to better understand what characterizes that information flow between these malicious and non-malicious actors. Um, the ultimate goal of my work is to inform some policy changes and work out strategies which can allow us to better flag this information online and prevent it from affecting people. Um, I personally believe that misinformation and disinformation is a massive issue which greatly affects vulnerable people. Um, I guess sort of a big picture, it's the sort of start of a framework, a proof of concept of that we can use these mathematical techniques to identify these real world events and they can be really meaningful. And to answer your question, there's lots of really good work on it um, and I'm working on a very small piece of that. Excellent. Um, are there any further questions from the judges? If not, we do have a question here from the audience. Uh, based on what you have found so far, do you think that Donald Trump's rally led to or increased the likelihood of the riot at the Capitol building? What we saw was that the discussion online definitely helped um, organise the riot in terms of the logistics of the day and how people actually got to the event and what was happening. Um, sort of more directly with response to Donald Trump, we can see, I might just jump back a few slides, um, even just looking at this very sort of 
frequency of um, hashtags across time, we can see that after Donald Trump spoke, there was a really big surge in the frequency of capital riots, which at least from the data set that we can see is telling us that yes, Donald Trump's actions that day did have an impact on how the events of the day unfolded. Um, of course, that's like a massive question, very complicated and multifaceted. Um, but from our perspective with our data, we can say that was a real world event, Donald Trump spoke, we saw a reaction within that social media network, whether or not that translated to a real world impact would require more research. Okay, I believe we have another question uh, from the judges. Uh, Can I go ahead? Yes, please. Uh, great presentation, Bridget. I really enjoyed uh, your work. Uh, just a question I had about the 100 users when you were filtering the data even fur further and you picked the 100, 100 participants or 100 Twitter users. What was this based on? Were they people who were tweeting or this included even um, the hashtags? Or This is what you're referring to, right? Yes. Perfect. So basically, if you mention someone within a tweet, that would be like if you tweeted and you said, you know, at Connor Patton, your presentation was really great today, that tweet would count as a tweet from you which mentioned Connor. Um, so what we did is we looked over our 1.8 million tweets and just pulled out the 100 people who are most frequently mentioned. The reason for that is when you build a network like this, you want you don't want to have lots of sparse clusters. So if we include every tweet in this network, what you end up with is lots of nodes, which are just someone who was mentioned once or not ever mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, so it was more of a matter of handling the really large data set and working with it in a meaningful way um, using these network tools. So we just, those hundred most frequently mentioned users, a hundred was arbitrary, that can change. Um, and then we just only included those tweets, which mentioned those users. So everyone's tweets were in that group, but only the tweets which mentioned those hundred most mentioned users were in there. Okay, um, that brings us to time for today's presentation. Uh, so, um, and that brings us to the end of today's session. Um, so I'd like to thank our judges, Dr. Celia Harris and Adiba Fattah, uh, and as well, congratulations to our student presenters. Uh, the recording from this session will be made available online following the conference. And we hope to see you in other conference sessions this week. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Well done. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye.